welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is part three and four in a fantastic paranormal series from Matt Richardson. As ever, do take a second to head over to his Reddit and uh, lose yourself for a few hours with his wonderful collection of stories that he's wrote over there. As always, please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share and help build this channel and help me smash through our 10k target by April on my two year anniversary. Without further ado, let's get into tonight's story entitled Navajo Glass Part 3 Let's get straight into that. A bad man visited me in the bathroom just then. The woman standing in front of me certainly looked like my wife. She matched all the physical characteristics to a T. Over the years, Emily's body became more familiar to me than my own. Bullet-sized birthmarks painted her pale arms, just like all the familiar imaginary constellations we made up in bed. Dark, tangled hair dripped over her bright blue eyes, just like it always did when wet. She had just come out of the shower, her slim, she would never call it that, body fit neatly into the confines of a pristine white bath towel. She looked normal. She looked exactly the same. She looked like it could have been any other night at home, only it wasn't. Both of us knew it never could be. Not after what just happened. Not ever again. He walked right through that mirror. Emily pointed and spoke slowly. She used that soft tone, reassuring tone usually reserved for life's most serious moments. That voice made me feel comfortable. That voice relaxed me. That voice made the stress drift from the roof of my chest and settle somewhere towards the back of my mind. I remembered it as my rock in a river in a storm of life's worst headaches and heartaches. You get the idea. Emily always had that way with me. The tribes called him that, you know, the bad man. For years and years, in dozens of different languages, bad, bad, bad. All he wanted was a little trade. I don't think that's bad at all. No, I think he's a good man. God, help me. She even smiled, just like she used to smile. My wife's thin red lips drew back graciously to reveal a row of perfectly white and rounded teeth. She dipped her head a bit, shyly, pushed her hair back and eyed me coyly. I knew that look. My wife perfected that look. I fell in love with that look. He made me feel better, Matt. Please believe me. I feel so much better. My soul is in a much better place. But I didn't believe her. I didn't believe a word of it. He could make you feel better too, you know. He saw you that night in the house. Because the woman standing in front of me could not be my wife. Well, aren't you going to say anything? I backed up towards the carrier in a corner of the room that held my sixth month old son. Emily seemed annoyed as her long nails pierced deep ringlets into her hips. Say something! I picked up my son and gave him a tickle. Ben giggled right back at me happily. He looked at peace. He looked like he had no concern for the chaos that would soon form around him. I don't understand. Emily smiled. Oh, what the bad man does? He takes a part of you and he sends it away to a safer place, to a happier place forever. You never have to leave that place, Matt. You can be with whomever, whenever, forever. Don't you want that? Who doesn't want that? I looked back at her stupendously. I knew that was a lie. My wife would never leave her son willingly. Then the other part of you, of course, the physical part, your manifestation. That part is left behind for us, for something wicked to play. You don't want to be around for that anyway. <laughs> Emily giggled as she air-quoted that last line. 
Her voice sounded foreign, deeper maybe, more animated than usual. She never laughed like that. She never even air quoted, let alone air quoting something as strange as that line. The shape of my wife walked forward elegantly and let the towel fall dramatically around her ankles. Her hot breath raked along my shoulder. The stench of rot and bacteria filled the air in nauseating waves. My stomach turned as Ben fussed from my arms. The woman reached out to touch him, but I didn't let her. I dodged her hand and darted towards the door. It only wants the baby, baby. Part of the bargain. It's not a bad deal, you know. One little shit soul for the price of eternal happiness. What? Should I laugh? Should I cry? Laugh, cry, run, or die? Those were my options. My sleep and oxygen-deprived brain returned back. I followed none of them and stood there like a stupid statue. Emily. She hissed. That beautiful but horrid fucking creature in front of me actually hissed. Bits of spit flew from the edges of those beautiful teeth and dry lips that I kissed so many fucking times before. Her tongue forked at the end in a way I never recognised. And when she slapped me, I felt the sting of blood forming from the sharp edges of those damned ruby red nails. Now, why would you call me that? Ben started to cry. I backed away. I knew we were running out of time. Silly boy, stop playing games. Emily's eyes faded from their familiar blue to an unsettling red. Hair wet, beautiful hair clumped together in bizarre tendrils that dangled in front of her eyes as she approached me. She looked like she wanted to hurt me again. She looked like she wanted blood. But my fingers curled around the handle as I turned it evenly to the left. Why would you call me by the name of that slut when you know full well I just cut her insides up in the sink? I pulled open the door and hustled my son through the narrow opening. I slammed it shut behind me. The creature that called itself my wife howled from the other side. It abandoned a youthful, happy tone and resummoned the demonic bellowing of an animal chained in a cage that it would soon escape. Long nails dug deep holes in a frame of a pitiful little discount inn door. The creature screamed something, the same something, over and over again as her fist and feet wowed uncontrollably against the door that held her back. But I didn't want to wait to hear what it had to say. Navajo Glass, part four. Let's get straight into that. The path into Hawthorne Woods begins at the top of a very steep slope. The walkway is littered with weeds and surrounded by sky-high evergreens on either side. A single dilapidated sign marks the entry point and the descent downward is treacherous, if you're not careful. There's little room to your left or to your right. There are no railings or tree branches or other forms of support to hold onto. A local Boy Scout troop built some steps back in the 90s, but the wood chipped and eroded over the years. The slick pine leaves scattered on top rendered them useless, along with the inactivity. You really needed to know where to place your feet. The rain doesn't help this situation much, either. The storm never broke for a second that night. The steady rhythm of tiny drops pattering away on my windbreaker had a soothing effect. It kept my mind on the task at hand, one step at a time, one foot in front of the other. My baby boy, Benjamin, sniffled a bit from the comfort of a pouch like pack that kept him close to my chest. In my hands, I held the dishevelled remains of a tent, a Remington rifle, and a loose plan in a mind for the next few hours. Are you ready, bud? Adventure time with Daddy. Ben smiled at me slyly. Do you trust Daddy? He giggled. Of course you do. Not much of a choice, right? The last step down into Hawthorne felt like salvation to my overextended knees. I sat on the soaked wood and surveyed the overgrown marsh that was once my childhood stomping grounds. The path was overgrown. Mosquitoes and gnats hung in a thick air, in excess of what I ever remembered. Remnants of skunk cabbage and discarded beers clung to the thorn bushes like ornaments. The trees had taken back most of the small lake on the other side of the marsh. The rain flooded the creeks over their capacity. But, even with the dismal weather, spinning bugs, 
but the moon and my prior knowledge had some advantages in this particular corner of the forest. I knew where to go next. Daddy's got a plan, but Daddy's always got a plan. I immediately recognised the old gnarled tree that jutted out like a seat. I could still see the tiny bridge over the stream. My mum's old house still loomed behind our backs like a dimly lit mansion. The woods dipped up and down through the foothills of the Appalachian Trail, but the path only extended one direction, west. Looks like home, Big Ben. Twenty yards or so ahead, the route opened up to a wide clearing about fifteen feet wide. I pitched the corners of our tent around some nearby trees and laid the wrinkled base with my son still attached to my chest. Once the overhead was set up, I laid him down and now the remaining stakes into place. Bedtime for you, buddy. I kept replaying conversations, trying to find something, anything to help my fracturing family out of this situation. The heart-wrenching drive away from the discount inn gave me plenty of time to think. I dissected nearly every single encounter pertaining to the broken glass sitting on my bathroom floor. I focused on one morning in particular, the one in which I first met my future mother-in-law. I was nervous that day, so nervous that Emily had to hold my hand just to keep it from shaking. The meeting was the first of only a few occurrences, but in my memory this woman stood clear as day, larger than life, in the centre of her living room, marvelling at the vast collection of antiques in her living room. Do you see those two mirrors? She pointed. Navajo glass. They don't make it any more. Ugly, heavy things in the end. My own mother used to say, even if it shatters, you're supposed to wear it as jewellery. They're amulets. Windows, I believe she called them. The poor woman passed away from heart complications later that year. The grief from her death overtook our small family. My wife always claimed she would never be the same. I never did hear much more about those mirrors after that. They sort of became a sore topic at the house soon after. But it was the last part of Melanie's comment that stuck out to me now, like a sore thumb. I only wished it hadn't taken me so long to see it. Windows. I looked down at the two large pieces of Navajo glass now tied around Ben and my neck. Let's hope so. The next few hours fell into quiet monotony. I watched my son sleep. I watched the rain drip and pool into even little puddles outside the tent's foundation. I listened to the thunder crack and harass the swaying trees around me. I waited, mostly for what I assumed must happen next. The woods have a unique way of amplifying and isolating the most unusual sounds. I counted on the fact more than any other. Sometime, just after three in the morning, I was not disappointed. The creature sounded like a large animal breaching itself from the water. The suction alone seemed massive, a waterfall of dripping liquid followed soon after as an animal dragged itself in its first step forward somewhere by the lake. Adrenaline coursed through my veins like a drug, and my plan fell into place. I knew what I had to do. I turned my back to the general area, held up the glass, and waited for something to appear in the reflection. But nothing did. The cracked little piece of Navajo glass did not give much in the way of line of sight. My normal surroundings appeared normal. The tent sat in the same position. That same jutted tree stood out in the distance. The wind bellowed into the branches like drunks, but other than that, nothing appeared to be amiss. The night looked the same as any other. That is until Ben started to cry. It was like a bad omen. The moment he cried, the blood in my pounding veins turned to ice. I could feel the air around me getting colder. I could feel something unnatural near me. I, I panicked. I brandished the rifle, vaguely threatening anyone or thing that hoped to approach. I fidgeted frantically with the glass and backed away towards the entrance of the tent. Finally, the mirror found pay dirt and my breath caught in my chest. The shadow of a man stood approximately twenty feet to my left. He paused. He looked at me curiously. He hesitated a moment and then he started walking towards us slowly and confidently 
with one foot placed lazily in front of the other, over the sinking marshlands and up towards the campsite, like it were any other day in the park. That's right, come on you son of a bitch, I muttered under my breath, I'm right here. I pushed Dimmeru back and forth to try and get a better vantage point. The man closed the distance between the clearing quickly. He stood tall, well over six feet tall to be exact, which dwarfed my significantly smaller frame. The blurriness made the shadow look almost familiar. The moon dipped through the trees and reflected just right. Dark, tanned skin met long, matted hair that fell in waves to the shoulders. I couldn't see all of the features on his face, but I could see one thing, and that is the fact that he was smiling. Rows and rows of sharp white teeth stuck out like daggers in his mouth. They were hard to miss. In the middle of the woods, all alone, the bad man must have thought he'd finally got his price. He must have thought he would get everything he wanted. I must have looked like a juicy steak to him. Standing there like a sheep in the middle of the forest. But the son of a bitch was missing one key detail. Bait is best served cold and bullets hurt a lot more than spears. I waited just a little bit longer, with my back turned to the threat. I waited until I could hear the creature's footsteps just a few yards away from my campsite. I waited until my son, Ben, started screaming so loud that his tantrum could have woken the neighbours. I waited until my shot could be perfect, because I knew there would not be many more if the first one missed. Then I turned and spent every bullet I brought. I didn't know if my shots landed. I don't know if I actually hit anything more than a tree. It was chaos. Without the advantage of the glass in my hand, the shadow disappeared in front of me as suddenly as it had arrived. I sprayed the general area over and over again, stopping stupidly to reload each time, check my surroundings and fire again. I thought I heard something fall. I thought I heard something scream, but I couldn't be sure. The storm and my son's crying made everything other sound seem soft and subtle. After one full minute of extended gunfire, I paused and surveyed the damage around me. Silence. I scooted into the tent and quickly tied Ben back to the pouch on my chest. The tears were drying on his face. He smiled at me, a weird, creepy smile, like he knew a secret he wouldn't share. Could it really be that easy? I picked up the glass and tried to find the shadow in its reflection once again. I checked the places I fired. I checked the lake. I even checked the path that took us into the woods in the first place. Not a single trace of the shadow in the mirror remained. I could hear the voices in the neighbourhood behind us. Human voices this time. Thank God. Somebody heard the gunshots. I sprinted up and out of the stairs of Hawthorne to my parked car on the street. I plopped Ben into his seat and wrapped the straps around him quickly. The next part of my plan would be guesswork. If the bad man could die, and if he did die, maybe my wife would be okay. The road to the discount inn only sat a short five minutes from the woods. I spent through every hairpin turn and gambled every yellow light. I pulled into the parking lot, sweaty and exhausted. At just past 3.30, I took a breath, caught myself, and stared into the wide eyes of my son in a rearview mirror. He smiled. You ready, bud? Moment of truth. I carried Ben up the rain-soaked steps of the motel to room 13. Those few moments felt like walking a plank. I waited for him to cry. I waited for the inevitable wailing of a demonic creature currently occupying my wife's room and body to fill the quiet motel hallway. But the chaos never came. Rain drizzled evenly on the railings. That same steady pattern regained its soothing effect. I knocked slowly on the door. Two quick knocks at first, and then one slow one. Just like we always did at home. There was a stirring in the bed. I could hear that much. Somebody got up and walked slowly over to the door. When a voice called out, I listened carefully and bit my tongue to keep from shouting in relief. Matt? I paused. I needed to be sure. Matt, are you okay? I was so worried. Emily opened up the door in a bright white nightgown. She looked beautiful but exhausted. The wrinkles on her forehead and the lines of her eyes played out more prominently than ever. When she spoke, 
She sounded sick or like she'd been just woken up from a long sleep. Where did you guys go? I just woke up and no one was home. I didn't say anything. I didn't believe it. Not yet. I turned around and carefully held up the Navajo glass. I angled it just right, with the edges in both hands so its reflection gazed back, like a camera directed at my tiny, little family. Ben and my wife smiled peacefully by my side. Wow, wow, fantastic stuff. Thank you ever so much, Matt, for letting me work with you once again. Um, absolute pleasure every time, buddy. Great stuff. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I. As ever, please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought. Let me know what you're up to this weekend. What are you doing for your Sunday, chilling out with family, or possibly spending a day out somewhere nice, enjoying the weather. And above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>